of the Network Trust uh, is Professor uh, Ian Rainey. Uh, he is the Dyson, a professor in ceramics with extensive experience uh, in the glass sector. Uh, my copy is uh, Professor William Simpson. He is the chief uh, scientific officer of the Graphene Center at the University of Manchester and has extensive experience working with the paper industry. Uh, also, uh, Cameron Playdol Pears. Uh, he's professor at the University of Swansea, and he is uh, one of the co-directors of the Sustain Hub for Sustainable uh, Steel Manufacturing. We are supported by a broad industry advisory panel that is chaired by uh, Chris uh, Chris McDonald, and also we can with an excellent support team, uh, Deborah uh, Froggett and uh, Neil Laurie who enable all our activities to be conducted. Next, please. So the core aim of this Network Plus uh, is to identify and co-create with foundation industries a new science and technology that will enable transformation towards sustainable, cost-efficient and products practices. So these uh, concepts are widely discussed uh, nowadays, but we have been focusing all our activities in six may, major of core themes. One is resource efficiency, which is the main topic of the workshop that we will be attending today. We also looking at next generation processes, manufacturing informatics, or digitalization, circular economy, which is also a topic that we will discuss today, policy and advocacy and equality, diversity and inclusion. So we are very proud that although we are a young network, at the moment, we are more than 350 members, which actually shows uh, that there is the need for this community, or at least the desire for the community to come together to tackle different challenges that are linked to foundation industries. Uh, as uh, most of you might know, we also have some funding that we are allocating uh, in different uh, specialized uh, small calls. At the moment, we have already a sponsor, uh, six research projects, and actually we still have an open call that will be closed on the 1st of October. So those that have not submitted their applications, uh, please do so. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we are a very young network. We're starting in January this year. Uh, we have been hosting different workshops uh, throughout the past months. Uh, today will be the resource efficiency and circular economy workshop. And as I mentioned, we will have a uh, closing the second project's call in the same topic of this workshop by October. So please make the most of this opportunity today to gather together, perhaps to spark some new ideas uh, for applications for this uh, funding. We also host uh, the Blue Skies Green Futures webinars, uh, showcasing groundbreaking technologies for foundation industries. So we also welcome some ideas from our community about what topics uh, would you like to listen in the next uh, webinars coming. Next, next slide, please. So uh, I invite everyone to visit our website. Uh, Debbie has done an amazing job uh, putting a lot of resources available for our community. Uh, I invite people also to join us. Uh, you just have to fill a very short membership form, a couple of minutes, and then that will give you access or, uh, for newsletters that we produce every month, also funding opportunities, and we have a special uh, area in the website for members to access some of the documents and information that we have been gathering uh, over the past uh, events that we have been hosting. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, uh, we organized the Blue Skies Green Future. So I would like to uh, take the opportunity to remind uh, our community that on Friday, the 24th, we will be hosting uh, one of the webinars in supply chain resource sustainability and decision science. Uh, this one will be uh, delivered by Professor Lenny Coe. So it's very timely and important uh, for the topic that we will be discussing in this workshop, but also for the open uh, project calls that, that we currently have. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, uh, now 
uh, I would like to invite uh, our one, our first speaker, uh, Keith uh, James from Grab, uh, to to start uh, his presentation. So uh, just a little bit of housekeeping reminder to everyone. Uh, next slide, please. There will be two breakup uh, sessions during the workshop. Each breakup room will be run by one of our team members. Breakup rooms will be around 25 minutes. Breakup sessions will be recorded, but this is for note taking purposes. If anyone has any uh, comment about that, please let us know by the chat and the chat function will be available during the breakup rooms as well as the variable discussion. So final slide, please. And this is just a kind reminder of how you can get in touch uh, with us via email, Twitter, or just by visiting our website and filling the forms. So thank you very much. So yes, I would like to, to invite our first speaker. So Keith James, uh, Keith is head of policy and insight in Grab. He leads a team of experts across uh, Grab's areas of interest to support policymakers around the world. He leads uh, on developing insights, which form the development and implementation of policy, supporting a circular economy relating to food, plastic, textiles, and resource, resource management. So, Keith, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, so I'm going to uh, be mainly talking about some work we've been doing with the University of Leeds over the last year or so. Um, and putting that in the context of the foundation industries in delivering net zero. Um, but to start off with, as you've seen in the previous webinars in this series, um, there's been a lot of focus on energy production and energy efficiency. Uh, and we still expect that to be the dominant topic at COP uh, in terms of where to look for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but there are other areas that we need to look at. Uh, so energy is used not for its own sake, but to deliver services and utility. And it's there to help provide material resources. Uh, so particularly glass, metal, paper, steel, uh, food, and so on. So all the resources we use are what are driving energy use. And so actually we need to change the way we use materials. Uh, what we've seen ahead of um, COP is obviously uh, the UK has now passed a carbon budget. Uh, carbon budget six, um, but we are we don't have all the measures in place yet to achieve carbon budget four. Never mind the ambition of carbon budget six, which is half of what carbon budget five is. So at the moment, there's a gap between the policies that we've introduced and the level of ambition that we have. Uh, the great thing about taking action on material use uh, is that it's action that can be taken today. And it's action that can start reducing UK greenhouse gas emissions today as well. One of the reasons that we think that resource use uh, is vital um, is because of some other work that we've been doing with the University of Leeds, DEFRA and their Resource and Waste Technical Experts Group. And we've been looking at forecasts for resource use. So this is raw material demand for the UK between now and 2050. Uh, you might be wondering why natural gas, oil and coal uh, are still so prominent in this projection. And this is because this is a taking account of the materials that we import to the UK as well. So it's determined by the policies, not just in the UK, by, but by the countries we import from as well. So unless they reduce their demand for coal or their natural gas, we are indirectly still relying on those fossil fuels to provide the materials that we need that do go directly into our economy. So we think reducing greenhouse gas emissions is inconsistent with increasing resource use. There's a fundamental need to reduce the amount of materials that we're using and to do so in a way that supports the economy uh, and supports people's jobs as well. If we include emissions overseas that are incurred by the resources that we demand in the UK, we can see actually with that top line with the gray bars, that the carbon footprint of the UK actually isn't changing that much. So we're making huge strides with our territorial emissions, the emissions that directly arise in this country. We're not really making the same amount of progress in, when we consider carbon emissions embedded in the products we use 
come from overseas as well. So uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is vital. Reducing the way we change resources can reduce our emissions overseas as well. Uh, so earlier this year, we published a report with the University of Leeds uh, on net zero, why resource efficiency holds the answers. Uh, and that contains eight strategies in there that can all be taken today and they can be taken by individuals, businesses and policy makers. It's not just about the long term, it's about now as well. So the government has a, a 10 point plan um, between now and 20, sorry, between 2023 and 2032, uh, which forecasts that um, they can reduce emissions by about 200 million tonnes. Uh, the emission savings from these strategies over that same time period could be an additional 100 million tonnes. So we could deliver 50% more than the government's plan. And that would put us well on the track for carbon budgets four and five. It would also set us up nicely for carbon budget six. It could potentially deliver up to 10% of the emissions reductions that are required between the fifth and sixth carbon budget. Uh, so we're not positioning this as the answer. It won't get us to net zero on its own, but we think it's an essential part of the solution. Uh, so as well as the 100 million tonnes that we say between 2023 and 2032, the emission savings overseas could also uh, take that up to 364 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent saved over that time period. And between now and 2050, we could, the opportunity is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions incurred by the UK by, by 2 billion tonnes. So it's a huge opportunity. Uh, I wanted to focus on three of the strategies that I thought were most relevant to the foundation of industries today. Uh, so that's recycling more in the UK, switching from goods to services, and making better use of existing products. Um, so recycling has been a huge success story over the last 20 years. It's a sector that now employs 100,000 people, uh, and it's contributing increasing amounts to the UK's gross value added year on year. The challenge from a greenhouse gas perspective is that we're exporting a lot of that recyclers and it's then going into manufacturing processes overseas. So whilst the globe is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the UK is missing out on an opportunity to reduce its territorial emissions because we're still using virgin products and virgin materials when actually we could be using recycled materials in their place. I'm sure um, I'm not saying anything shocking to anyone on the call now, but that's where the opportunity is. What we see is that international markets are a threat. Uh, so lots of the countries that we have been sending recycled materials to uh, over many years are now closing their borders. They've got concerns about quality. They've got concerns about contamination. And so there is a need to do more with a recycler in this country. But actually, there's a huge economic opportunity from doing that as well. Uh, the work that RAP does is very much focused on collecting more for recycling and so what we think the opportunity is for industry is to do more to actually process that. So some of the things that we're doing at the moment is supporting industry through initiatives such as the UK Plastics Pact. So what we can see is that there has been huge growth in recycling of plastics over time, but we're still heavily dependent on export markets. And so with UK Plastics Pact signatories, what we're looking to do is increase the demand for recycled content in domestic production. Uh, so that's one of our targets there. We're also doing more to engage with local authorities to help them to collect more at the right quality to feed into production processes. And so we have a local authority portal where they can access information. Uh, we're helping them with the communications with citizens as well. So we know there are issues, for example, with flats and houses in multiple occupation. So we've been undertaking research to identify what we can do that's going to improve the quality and the proportion of materials that's diverted. Uh, and again, that's all available on our website. Uh, and this week, uh, as I hope you've noticed, is Recycle Week. Uh, so uh, there's an opportunity for all of your businesses to get involved in Recycle Week and help promote the messages. Uh, and there's something different happening each day this week. Uh, we always do well trending on Twitter. We get a lot of people talking about it. But the great thing about Recycle Week is we can see through our follow-up surveys that is leading to change in behaviour. Uh, so people tell us that they're doing something different as a result of Recycle Week. Uh, so we think this is a really effective uh, campaign and we'd be very pleased to have more support from foundation industries on that. Switching from goods to services uh, is where we think there's a, a real opportunity and a real financial opportunity. And so the challenge here for the foundation industries is about value retention. 
Um, we might call this sweating your assets. So looking at how we can get more value from the products that we're um, feeding materials into. Uh, so from an environmental point of view, renting items that are used less frequently, uh, instead of buying them can increase the utility of those items. So we can increase their usage and get more value out of them. There's big fin uh, financial opportunities here. So we think there's an opportunity for the sector to employ about 30,000 people uh, and lead to uh, a big increase in UK GVA as well. Um, but we think the two key areas when we're thinking about territorial emissions are car leasing uh, and then also chemical leasing. Uh, so the average car is used for about three to 4% of the time and 8% aren't even used every week. Um, at any one moment in time, so even in rush hour, there's no more than 15% of the cars on the road. So there's a huge opportunity to do more with vehicles. Uh, and thinking about chemicals, uh, that's the, the second biggest opportunity for UK territorial emissions. Uh, so chemical leasing is not a new idea, but it hasn't necessarily taken off. And so we still think there's a huge financial opportunity here for the foundation industries uh, to do more through chemical leasing rather than uh, selling the chemicals. So selling the function of the chemical. Uh, there's a wealth of information available from the UN on this, uh, and they've got a range of case studies, including uh, organisations in the UK that have already engaged with this. When we're thinking about our consumption emissions, so including the impact uh, that we incur overseas, so vehicles are still important, but also then textiles are important. Uh, so there's an opportunity to do more with all textiles. And so RAP has recently launched a new voluntary agreement, Textiles 2030, uh, where we're looking to bring business together to tackle more and some of the key issues there will be around mechanical recycling but also chemical recycling of textiles as well. Uh, the final area I wanted to highlight today uh, was about making better use of existing products. Uh, so this is about the opportunity uh, for reuse uh, and making sure that products are recirculated. So the, the last theme was about rental. This is about repair, reuse and remanufacturing. So changing people's attitudes. Uh, and here we think as well, there's a significant opportunity. Uh, and we can see that there are lots of opportunities ju just very simply to make more use of the products that we have. Uh, so if we think about the size of the secondhand retail market, it's grown rapidly in recent years. Um, so according to um, the data that we've seen from ONS, uh, sales in specialized UK secondhand stores increased by 70% in value 17%, excuse me, in 2019. Um, eBay reported that pre-loved items uh, increased by 1400% between June 2018 and June 2020. Uh, and they think that lockdown accelerated pre-existing trends. Resale has been growing 25 times faster than the broader retail sector. So there's a huge opportunity to make more from the products that we already have. Uh, we think the opportunity in construction is slightly different. So it's the same principle, but there the opportunity is about bringing vacant properties into use and then reusing foundations and changing designs. So, for example, for sleepers on railway tracks, there's more that we can do to design better, more resource efficient products and then make more of the products that are already in existence. Uh, we think refurbishing products could add about £54 billion pounds to the UK. Uh, economy uh, and create over 300,000 jobs between now and 2030. Uh, so we think it's a significant opportunity for industry. Um, so those are what we see as the, the challenges of net zero, but also where we think the opportunities are for business. Um, very happy to take any questions and look forward to discussing this further in the breakout session. Thank you, Keith, for a very interesting presentation, very thought provoking uh, to know where things are going, uh, particularly regarding recycling. So I would like to take the opportunity to remind all our attendees that you can use the chat function uh, to uh, include your comments, potential questions for our speakers, uh, things that will be addressed uh, in the in the future. So now I would like to welcome our second speaker of the day, uh, Phil Ruxton. Uh, he is the Chief uh, Sustainability Officer at CRODA. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Southampton, uh, Phil Ruxton joined CRODA in 1994, 
on their uh, graduate scheme, uh, progressing through various sales and technical marketing roles across many of the Croda businesses. Uh, from 2012, Phil led Croda's Smart Materials Global business, uh, supplying bio-based uh, building blocks and additives into the polymer, adhesive and coating market. Phil was a founder member of the Crota's Global Sustainability Steering Group in 2007. The year Crota published its first annual sustainability report uh, in 2019. Phil moved a uh, role to lead the group sustainability activities at Crota, launched uh, their committee to be climate, land and people positive by 2030. Uh, Phil was promoted uh, to Chief Sustainability Officer in the spring 2021. So, uh, Phil, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Lopez. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you right. well. I can quite appreciate you're going to read out the bio. That's a bit overwhelming this time in the morning for everybody, but I, I do appreciate it. Um, thank you, uh, everybody. Thanks to the TFI Network Plus for the opportunity. Uh, I confess I feel a little bit of an intruder into your into your sessions and your Network Plus. As many of you will know, Croda probably doesn't associate itself as a bulk chemical. Um, producer, um, as the, the, the title of the presentation, you know, we are very much at the speciality chemical end of the of the industry, but I thought uh, talking to your colleagues, it sounded like it'd be a good opportunity to give you a different viewpoint. And when we're talking about resource efficiency, um, I thought I'd just share with you a couple of past, present and future case studies around Croda's use of bio-based waste streams. Um, and very interested in the uh, breakout sessions uh, with a couple of questions where we're very interested in the, uh, the uh, audience's views and thoughts on it. Um, please forgive me, um, as Chief Sustainability Officer, I couldn't start without commenting on Croda's sustainability strategy, but I'll be very quick. Um, sustainability is at the heart of Croda. Um, as many of you, the attendees, uh, hopefully will know, Croda is a, a British-based multinational specialty chemical company. Um, we sell into life sciences, which is healthcare, crop care, um, consumer care markets, and also into various industrial markets, including materials. We made last year a, a commitment, our first ever public 10 year strategy, focused on sustainability to be climate land and people positive. This is a restorative strategy. Um, it's about aligning our activities with the UN sustainable development goals um, and not just doing less bad, but looking to do, make a positive difference to people and planet. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time going through details, please. All I wanted to point out is under our climate positive um, ambitions, uh, we have a science-based target validated. We're the, only the third chemical company to have that globally at the one and a half degree scenario. And the reason I called this slide out today um, is really one of our objectives we call sustainable innovation. It's all around the increased use of um, bio-based raw materials to replace petrochemicals. Um, and that's something that Croda's got a huge experience in. Um, and so really, you know, what are we trying to do to reduce our carbon footprint? Um, well, we, we reduce our own and upstream emissions. Um, so looking at using bio-based raw materials, investing further in biotechnology, um, and obviously designing our bio-based products. Clearly we can't use that, that, that sequestered carbon uh, to contribute to our science-based target, biogenic emissions are outside the boundary, um, but it has a benefit. And then clearly we're looking to directly reduce our emissions through our supply chain. But I think equally important, um, and I appreciate you know, that this applies, you know, listening to um, Keith's presentation for RAP, is also about how do our products help avoid emissions downstream in their use? And we have plenty of uh, examples of clothing lifetime extension, um, using our ingredients in laundry detergents, through to VOC free paints, through to automotive light weighting. And there we're looking to help our customers see downstream benefits from emission reduction. But really today, I just wanted to um, highlight a couple of case studies um, around Croda's use of bio-based waste streams uh, and give you a, a past, present and future case study um, and a, a, you know, what we, need help on. Um, so Croda started, it was, was born nearly hundred years ago and it was born from taking a waste stream from the wool industry in the north of England um, and taking wool grease to convert to lanolin. And I'll just touch on that as a, a case study of a use of a, a bio-based waste stream. Um, 
We are today um, using biomass to generate ethylene oxide as, our, as a raw material for one of our key uh, product platforms, our Coxlet platform. And then I'll just touch on biotechnology as well, looking ahead and the, the need for sugar substrates. Wool grease then wool production. Um, most of you will be aware of this. I wasn't until I joined Croda, um, but you've got a lot of greasy wool and you've got to extract that wool, um, uh, clean the wool up, and you're left with this greasy, unctuous mass called wool grease. Um, Croda developed the technology to convert that into firstly lanolin, uh, used as a rust preventative and in cosmetics. But we've taken that beyond that over the last hundred years into a kind of biorefinery. Um, and I appreciate the purists amongst you might disagree, but it's a kind of biorefinery. We're, we're creating lanolin and then we're puritizing, purifying and derivatizing that lanolin through various chemical processes into hundreds of products. Um, and we've been, we're still the largest producer of lanolin and derivatives in the world. Um, and we are still developing new products from that stream. But where today can biomass replace petrochemicals? Um, certainly we have an immediate opportunity and immediate investment. It's Croda's largest investment globally in North America. And we're the first um, chemical company to invest in bio EO production in North America. So this is the concept of taking biomass derived ethanol um, and going through the, the recognized stages to generate ethylene oxide, um, which we then use to our coxalate um, and generate a whole range of surfactants. And we are doing this at kind of bulk chemical scale, kiloton scale uh, in North America. And that's something we're doing today. What's very interesting is um, it's in a way an example of circularity in the specialty chemicals industry. Uh, I'll just take you through this, um, the, the, this uh, cycle. Um, so if you start at the top, um, our use of renewable energy at Atlas Point means that our range of tween, our coxlets, it's one of our product ranges which are used in crop protection as adjuvants, was around 2.55 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of product. And that's a cradle to gate carbon footprint. As we switch from petro based EO to bio based EO, um, that, that product carbon footprint reduces by 12%, taking into account the sequestered carbon and the processing. We have a science based target to roughly halve our emissions by 2030. It's actually 46.4%, according to SBTI. So if Atlas Point, our manufacturing site, reduces their emissions by 50%, we'll see that go from 12% reduction to 23% reduction in cradle to gate carbon footprint. But the clever trick and the, the, the one that we are investigating, investing at the moment is at, at the moment, we're using corn-based ethanol. It's the most widely available um, source of ethanol, uh, biomass derived ethanol in North America. But if we can switch that to um, sugarcane feedstocks, um, particularly second generation waste biomass feedstock from sugarcane, that's got the potential to take that carbon footprint down 71% in 2018 levels. But what makes this quite interesting and circular is, as I mentioned, this, this product range is used in crop protection as an adjuvant. Um, and you can imagine um, that through our customer base, we are providing technologies that provide solutions into corn and sugarcane um, uh, agriculture. Um, and so there's quite a neat, neat circularity here where our products are going to help improve the yields and therefore potentially reduce the carbon footprint of the raw material on which they're based. So this is a live case study in Croda at the moment. And then just briefly looking ahead, um, industrial biotechnology, please, many of you are the experts, I am not. Um, but just to explain where Croda sits in the biotechnology space, uh, we have uh, significant investments in white biotechnology. We have a uh, manufacturer at scale at our Ditton site near Liverpool. We've recently invested in our new uh, uh, research and scale up laboratories in Daresbury. And we're quite Enza, a Swedish uh, biotech startup in Sweden. In green biotechnology, plant cell technology, we acquired IRB in Italy. And in blue biotech um, from the sea, um, we acquired Nautilus in Canada um, a couple of years ago. So we are investigating, we are at scale, we are supplying biotech-derived products today. 
but clearly we see it as critical to innovate and also improve sustainability along a generally recognized path of moving from chemistry through bioenzymatic catalysis to fermentation. Um, and people generally would suggest that increases our sustainability and innovation. But there's a big but in that and a big watch out. And you know, many of you will be very aware of this. Just because something uses biotechnology doesn't automatically increase sustainability. Yes, it's lower temperature fermentation versus chemical reaction, but pre-treatments and post-finishing treatments can have a massive impact on, for example, the carbon footprint, the resource consumption, the water footprint of those products. And this is where the, the real challenge is for Proda in the space we operate and for the use of biotechnology to ensure it is more fully sustainable. So what, what are we looking, what are we hoping for? What do we need to, to, to move forward in this space? Well, um, clearly one of the key substrate feedstocks are fermentable sugars um, for use in industrial biotechnology. And the challenge there is it's cost competitive, yes, highly sustainable um, considering waste streams, but it's also fermentable. Um, and that proves a challenge. Um, and there's a lot of pre-treatment required to get to that which can have an impact on the sustainability of the products if you look at their full carbon footprint. Um, clearly, there's a huge discussion at the moment about a, the use of biomass uh, for biofuel, as opposed to feedstock um, for chemical or biotechnology processes. And clearly, from a policy perspective, our hope and our discussions are around, let's ensure that the biomass is available as a feedstock as much as it is as a biofuel. And then really one of the challenges here is how do we empower consumer decision-making based on whether it's carbon footprint labeling as the example I gave here, or water footprint labeling or resource um, efficiency. Um, how do we get that downstream to be recognized and to nudge behavior? And then clearly through this, there's a consideration about, okay, so what is the consumer impacted taxation on based on things like the carbon footprint and the water footprint of products? So that was really just to ask some questions out there. Hopefully that's been interesting, giving you a couple of case studies. Um, Professor Lopez, I'll hand back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, for, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, it certainly uh, brings uh, some of the topics that we have discussed uh, in previous workshops about energy. So at the moment, we would like to invite all our attendees uh, to participate in this <laughs> question pool. Uh, should the use of waste uh, recycled biomass be prioritized as a chemical first stock uh, or as a biofuel? So please cast your answers and we will share the outcomes in a few minutes. So I would like to remind everyone that you're most welcome to, to put your comments, your questions to our speakers in the chat. And briefly after you cast your vote for this full question, we will be joining the breakup rooms. So everyone has been uh, allocated to three different rooms that will be moderated by one of our team members. And uh, we will have a scribe. Uh, and well, we look forward uh, to the interesting discussions that will take place in those breakout rooms. So we have the results, I think, of our pool. And uh, yes, was 43% of our attendees agree that we should use uh, waste recycled biomass uh, to be prioritized as a chemical first stock. 11% of our attendees disagree. And Actually, 47% agree that both should be prioritized. Of course, it's, it's always better to, to try to, to reach a good compromise. So I think uh, now we are going to start joining the different breakup rooms. Well, it's 11.20, so it's time for us to resume the activities in our workshop. Thank you very much to those that, that stay with us uh, this morning. So I'm very pleased to welcome our ne next speaker, uh, Professor Frank uh, Bond from uh, University of Manchester. Uh, he's Professor of Innovation and Sustainability at University of Manchester. 
Uh, he's the director of, of the Sustainable Consumption Institute and professor of innovation sustainability. He's interested in understanding and facilitating processes of transition towards more sustainable provision for key human needs, covering topics such as circular economy, net zero economy, and the way in which the changing boundaries between production and consumption affect just and sustainable provision. He has published widely on these topics and is associate editor of the journal on industrial ecology. So thank you very much, Professor uh, Frank. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me uh, to, uh, to speak. Uh, it's always nice to, uh, uh, to, to talk to people who are actually sort of uh, in industry and doing uh, things and it's always a good reality check. So I'm happy to uh, be scrutinized uh, um, uh, in terms of the things that I have to say. So the title of my uh, presentation is Beyond the Crossroads, uh, how the foundation industry can deliver on combined challenges. Uh, I mean, I don't have a lot of time. <coughs> um, so I decided to focus on, on a specific perspective to, uh, that, that you know, that's quite often used in the, the, the area of innovation and sustainability, uh, which is looking at transition. So I will sort of uh, uh, say a little bit about that and then uh, take it from there. So I have a, a kind of a, a um, disclaimer or message all the way at the beginning, and I hope I'm not sort of offending people by saying this, uh, and it's not sort of disregarding all the good work that has been done. Um, but I, I do have the feeling that I have to say something like this. Um, uh, so if at the end of the presentation you, you think, I've heard this all before, then you're actually right. Uh, because all of the things that I'm saying, they, we already know them for at least 15 or 20 years. So I think that one of the, you know, one of the main messages of, that, that I can actually give, and also what I would like to support, um, uh, is that you know that we should use our the, the knowledge that we already have and actually start implement it and some of the you know companies and players in the foundation industry and other industries and in government are actually doing that uh, but there's also still a huge amount of talking and visioning and and making roadmaps and stuff like that going on so it's really important to follow that up with actual action and sort of understand what are the barriers to you know that that sort of exist uh, for this translation from the thinking into action uh, and 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 i really believe what it, what it says here on the slide i really think that everything we know the knowledge that we need to actually make changes is you know it's all there uh, and as i said happy to be challenged by that um so I very quickly want to go to uh, four points. Uh, so uh, basically the first point is our current challenges require societal system transitions. So not just innovation at the firm level or changing uh, sort of consumer behavior or something like that. We need to change whole systems. And that is important uh, to, to take as a starting point, I think. Uh, in relation to that, the question is, uh, do circular economy and an industrial symbiosis actually sort of give us those system type of transitions that we are talking about. Um, and then uh, a couple of words specifically about the foundation industry. I'm not an expert, so you're much more sort of uh, well-placed uh, uh, to, to, to discuss this in the breakout groups. But I mean, there is an issue of the, of the foundation industry as a supplier to many systems of provision, which is, you know, in a way sort of uh, uh, um, uh, really great, but it's also, it carries a risk uh, uh, in a sense. And then two questions uh, that I sort of suggest for uh, talking about it in breakout uh, groups that actually sort of, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of formulated them in such a way that hopefully they lead to some action, let's put it that way. But first, uh, sort of this transition perspective. So this is a perspective you may have heard of it or uh, have seen it. I'm, I'm very quickly going to, uh, to present it. <clears throat> so this is based on an understanding of transitions that have happened in the past that are currently going uh, on. Um, uh, so I will sort of very briefly illustrate it uh, using sort of uh, the move to electric vehicles as an example. So the idea of the transition perspective that we have 
an existing system, which in the case of, of, of uh, mobility or personal mobility is uh, still is the combustion engine, where we use uh, gas uh, or uh, diesel, you know, uh, different types of uh, carbon based fuels to actually propel uh, our engines. Um, so that's the existing sort of system as we have it, and that system is quite resilient, so it's not so difficult, it's so easy to displace it. At the same time, we have niches of activities, sort of alternative technologies, alternative forms of mobility that, that also exist. And the transition is really about one of those niches or more of those niches becoming more sort of prevalent, uh, diffusing, diffusing uh, you know, within the UK, in different countries, uh, in such a way that eventually they replace the existing regime and form a new regime. So it becomes a new system or uh, it replaces the old system and it's it's equally resilient. So it's equally uh, uh, difficult to replace. And by that time, there will probably be new niches, you know, popping up with technologies that will sort of, you know, lead to a, a new wave of, of sort of system transition eventually. So this framing has been used uh, a lot for research. Uh, there's a lot of sort of empirical evidence for, uh, for different ways in which this replacement of the existing regime uh, by a new regime actually takes place, the conditions under which it plays or uh, uh, takes place or doesn't take place. So there's, there's a lot of sort of information. I can't share that with you, but I mean, I'm happy to discuss that at some other point if you would want that. Um, and then uh, not unimportant in the, in the current situation, there are landscape events. So there are events that actually sort of uh, play a role in, in, uh, in a transition like this. Um, so, and this is the example that I gave, um, <clears throat> and uh, in, in, the, in this case, and also in, in sort of the current situation for the foundation industry, landscape events are, are things like Brexit and COVID, you know, the small little things that uh, we can't really influence, but at the same time, they are, you know, they shape very much the situation that we are in, and we have to deal with them, and they can provide opportunities as well as, uh, as threats, of course. So this is the perspective that I use and that I sort of, you know, so one of the, 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 the virtues of, of looking at it, at things from this perspective is that it pulls you out of very um, sort of detailed discussions about day to day activities, because the timeline here, you know, this may be 20 or 30 years. Yeah, sometimes it happens faster, but very often a transition actually takes 20 to 30 years. So this gives you a completely different perspective and line of thinking. So where are we currently? So currently we are in, in a situation where we have many challenges and ambitions. Um, we are talking about net zero, circular economy. Uh, we should also be talking about climate risk. So the increased sort of prevalence of, of climate uh, disruption uh, that is going to be sort of more prevalent in, in the next five to 10 years. We have to deal with Brexit, post COVID recovery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so part of the challenge, I think, is that we it's really difficult to just talk about climate change or uh, uh, to just talk about becoming a circular economy. You actually have to do all those things at the same time. So part of the ambition uh, is to actually think about how those ambitions can be sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, approached in a synergetic way. Uh, and there are some studies, uh, for instance, from the Green Alliance that are re really looking at, uh, you know, how to sort of do resource efficiency and also net zero at the same time, because sometimes those things, you know, actually go against each other. Uh, a second uh, uh, sort of or, or a related point here is that these challenges and ambitions they don't necessarily, you know, uh, are about the foundation industry, but I mean, they're typically discussed in terms of areas of provision. So this is about, you know, what uh, does housing look like or what does mobility look like or food look like uh, if we want that to be net zero or circular or whatever. And of course, the foundation industry is a really important part of that. So, but the discussion is very often about a system where the foundation industry is only a part of. And I think that's really important to, to also uh, take into account. So this is actually drawn from this report from Green Alliance, uh, which is based on work that has been done by the University of Leeds. Uh, and this is just, uh, uh, so this is an example uh, about uh, construction as an activity. So how uh, resource uh, efficiency can actually help us uh, to uh, reduce um, uh, sort of um, uh, 
CO2 emissions. And I mean, we can talk about these, these estimates. Uh, well, we should probably invite somebody from, from Leeds or from Green Alliance to sort of talk about the details. Um, but I mean, it's really clear that, that here there are options where we uh, also, some of them were mentioned by Keith James, uh, where there's actually an alignment between sort of uh, achieving net zero and, uh, and also um, uh, sort of being more resource efficient. The question is, what does this mean for the uh, foundation industry? Yes, because in some cases it means that the materials that are currently in use will be replaced by other materials. So it will put some people out of business. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's also part of this transition perspective. And we need to talk about that, you know, how, how does that actually work and how can you make sure that you're part of the, the, the business that is not uh, sort of uh, uh, moved out of the market. So one uh, uh, sort of a specific point uh, relating to the topic that we're talking about, and again, sort of trying to look at it from the transition perspective. So what does this mean for industrial symbiosis and circular economy? So very quickly, the definitions of, the, of those two sort of terms, uh, as I look at them, uh, industrial symbiosis is, is sort of networks of long or short term exchanges between firms of waste flows and byproducts. And those firms typically are co-located. That doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but very often it is. So it's very often some kind of industrial complex where byproducts and waste flows are exchanged. Total economy is more ambitious, you could say in the sense that it uh, is about uh, uh, providing for human needs uh, 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 by using a system that has clo closed loop processes that cover production, transport and consumption. So this is not just about some production facilities exchanging some waste flows. This is actually about creating a system of provision that has closed loops. And again, the foundation industry is, you know, or, or parts of the foundation industry are sort of part of those systems, but they are never that system as a whole. So one of my points is, if you want to achieve circular economy, if you want to meet those challenges, then you will always need to engage with those bigger systems, those systems of provision, which are transport um, uh, um, um, or mobility, uh, housing, etc. Uh, one sort of consequence and one question that, that, that follows from this is that if you build industrial symbiosis networks, then almost by definition, you create dependencies between firms and these dependencies actually create lock-ins. So this basically means that you make the regime stronger. So it makes it more difficult to actually get a transition of the whole system. Um, so, uh, and that's also true for certain forms of circular economy. So I think we have to be really sort of careful with sort of thinking about which forms of industrial symbiosis and which forms of circular economy are actually sort of uh, sort of adaptive or adaptable enough that they can actually be part of, of a future system that we want as a whole. So whether that's about sort of providing mobility or providing for food. So that's one of the challenges that we need to look at. Uh, so what does that actually mean, you know, when you're sort of, you know, one of the, the players, uh, when you have to actually sort of uh, survive as a business in the foundation industry? Uh, so one uh, sort of very concrete uh, point to think about is to, you know, what are the forms of circular economy and industrial symbiosis that are flexible enough that they can actually be part of the, the future system of provision and of future UK society in 2050, so that we don't lock ourselves into uh, to, uh, to unsustainable ways of providing for things. The second point is that, you know, looking at this transition framing, uh, that it's, uh, I think, crucial to engage with multiple niches, so multiple areas where new sort of forms of mobility, new forms of, of food provision, et cetera, uh, are being experimented with. And that's maybe a little bit sort of, you know, uh, far from the thinking about exchanging waste flows, but actually engaging with those multiple niches is engaging with the future businesses and the future systems that the foundation in the industry will need to feed into. So get on the bandwagon early. And the third uh, uh, sort of uh, point is, uh, uh, think about your mission or rethink about your mission and think about your mission in terms of the value that you create for others, rather than thinking about it in terms of I'm sort of in the business of producing this specific material. 
Yeah, so and here the I think the really good example is about companies that used to be in waste management now talk about themselves as resource brokers. So that's a, a, a really good example of rethinking your mission, where you're still sort of working uh, uh, with your uh, the existing capabilities, but you have a completely different idea about what you're actually doing, what the value is that you're delivering. So what Keith was talking about earlier in terms of, of uh, product service systems is an example of this, this kind of rethinking your mission. So based on this, uh, there's uh, like two questions that I would propose for discussion in the, in the breakout groups. <clears throat> um, and the first question is, which combination of challenges are you currently facing and what business opportunities arise from them? Uh, and again, sort of try to think about that in terms of this uh, transition framing. And the second one is a little bit uh, cheeky maybe. Uh, so what do firms within the foundation industry need to change to ensure that governmental agencies create the conditions to capture those business opportunities? I've been in countless meetings where business is blaming uh, government and government is blaming business for you know not making the steps that they you know, that, that need to be taken before they can do something so the question here is how can you get government to do what what you think they should be doing so that's my uh, sort of contribution to uh, to the discussion today well thank you frank you are finishing your presentation with two very thought-provoking questions that hopefully will spark uh, some very interesting conversations uh, during the breakup rooms. So thank you very much. I would like once again encourage our attendees to place your comments, uh, suggestions, uh, questions uh, about this talk in, in the chat. So now we're moving on to, to our last uh, speaker of the day. Last but by no least, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Williams. He is the head of industry decarbonization at Industry Wales. Uh, Dr. Chris William is a fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, he has 30 years of experience in the steel industry and was seconded into Industry Wales during 2020 to continue the leadership role for the South Wales Industrial Cluster. So Chris, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Just do uh, an audio check, just a uh, thumbs up, you can hear me. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so Chris Williams, um, I hope I've interpreted this right, and I think it seems to follow on from what uh, Frank has just discussed in the previous um, uh, presenters as well. Um, so I'm going to talk through the sort of developing uh, South Wales Industrial Cluster. Just to recap a little bit in terms of history, of course, the sort of cluster's mission came out of COP24, Claire Perry's task force, um, how is the UK going to lead the world in net zero steel making, net zero chemicals, net zero plastics? Uh, what do we need to do and how are we going to do it? Uh, and the recognition then of the need to form these industrial clusters. Um, I, I, I suppose the main inference around those clusters and the main driver for Bayes at the moment is around CCS and the infrastructure and hydrogen. But of course, underneath that, there's the importance of energy efficiency, resource efficiency and the drive for the circular economy. So South Wales Industrial Cluster is one of those recognized clusters. It's uh, sort of the new kid on the block when you compare to Humberside, Teesside, Northwest and Scotland. Um, but we like to think we're catching up and, uh, and developing much more of a holistic approach than maybe um, some of the clusters have had to focus on because they've got big projects to, uh, to get in and get moving. So South Wales Industrial Cluster just sort of uh, shows and fits but of course what what this does is it helps pull people together in their region in the area with that net zero ambition you know nobody argues with that bit everybody agrees net zero so everybody comes on board with that common goal um, and that really then has, has helped pull people together and, uh, and and want to work together uh, so we had our first meeting in January 2019 um, 68 people turned up at that meeting uh, 38 different companies uh, spanning in geographically on the area um, shown on the slide. Um, really, we knew we were the second largest CO2 emitting region in the UK, mainly because we've got an integrated steelworks and, and an oil refinery, whereas Humberside's got an integrated steelworks and two oil refineries, and then chemicals, oil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
cement, uh, make, make the other emissions up around that. Within South Wales, we have got a nice spread of foundation and other manufacturing capabilities, um, a nice spread of chemical sector as well, uh, but not to the scale of the other clusters. So we came together, we started to learn a little bit about each other. It was quite surprising how little communication went on between the different companies and between the different groupings. Um, and, and over the last two years, things have moved so much further forward in terms of how much we all now talk to, talk to each other and engage. So we knew we had 16 million tonnes a year of CO2, that includes power, um, and that's energy from waste, um, biomass um, and gas, CCGT. Um, we knew we had huge LNG import terminals, so uh, South Wales is feeding 20 to 30% UK natural gas. We know we've got a huge tidal range, and we know we've got onshore and offshore uh, floating winds, so huge renewable capabilities. Um, but the challenge we've got is that we don't have geological storage of, of CO2, as shown in the industrial decarbonisation challenge. You know, the main known stores of CO2 are, are up north in the south. We've got a bit of a different challenge to face. Um, so we are exploring CO2 shipping. Uh, but also, of course, maybe it, it brings forward carbon capture utilisation um, as a, may, maybe more viable in the south of the UK than the north of the UK. And therefore, considering CO2 as a byproduct, um, as an unutilized resource, uh, it is something that we wanted to feed strongly through our thread of investigations as we developed our, our route to net zero. And right from that first meeting, uh, circular economy um, was one of the first um, subject matters we wanted to make sure as a group we covered. So it was how do we develop South Wales industry into a net zero super economy supporting region. So we, we formed a bit of a steering team. So um, I, I was Tata Steel at the time um, and moved into Industry Wales then on secondment to, to lead. We got Falero, Rockwell, Calagas, Valley, Nickel, and Celsa. So there's a few on the call today. Owen, uh, in particular, at Celsa. Um, we formed that bit of steering team to try and act and pull pull the region together. We knew there was uh, support funding coming up from Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, but also transforming foundation industries. So how can we as a group try to use those funding mechanisms to facilitate uh, and support the development of some of the options? So I've got a quick slide to go through in terms of cluster plan. We've got 30 partners, deployment project, which is the bigger funding for doing design studies, uh, 17 partners. But in, in terms of this topic and, and today, um, we, we managed to get funded, which is finished now, finished in the July, a uh, project called South Wales with Both Eyes Open, which some of you will recognise the, uh, the name from. Um, and, and we use that to act as almost like a team building exercise to pull our industries together to explore resource efficiency, understand and, and educate ourselves a little bit more on, on the circular economy and, and how we can affect that. And also we look for other funding opportunities as well, like IETF and and others. So as we started to understand, okay, how are we going to develop our region into this net zero circular economy supporting area? Uh, we sort of went through, okay, we've got three main streams. The first mainstream is your individual site. Um, the second mainstream is the infrastructure then that you're going to need. And you really you could break this down uh, in, into another one as well, because hydrogen supply. Uh, low carbon electrical supply I've got within infrastructure. So maybe you could separate it out, but, but I haven't. I've kept it within infrastructure because that's suppose the way we see it as, as industries. Um, and then of course, in terms of breaking down that bigger area into smaller area underneath the heading, but also then trying to understand the policies, financials. So the subsidy mechanisms that are gonna come forward to understand that um, and help us make decisions. So when you consider each individual site, um, we, we have then developed what we call a five-step approach where we look at the energy efficiency opportunities at that site. We look at the resource efficiencies within that site and really push and explore what we can do and, and, and uh, support the greening of that individual site. We push that a little bit further then in terms of fuel switching and development to net zero. And then we go into smart networks, which is industrial symbiosis. Um, we've got these different 
uh, industries dotted around. We've been through steps one and two. So we've got a pretty good idea of what the opportunities are, what the byproducts are, what the wastes are, um, what the inputs are. How can we try and sort of fit and match those together through symbiotic opportunities? How can we attract inward investment, greenhouses, um, district heating schemes, uh, other options for what we can do in, in, in terms of waste processing, et cetera, to, uh, to improve that industrial symbiotic opportunity. So then we've got that factory, theoretically, as lean and green um, as we can, uh, with potential, hopefully, inward investment and uh, uh, opportunities around it. We then look for carbon capture utilization. How can we use that CO2 back in the process? Can we attract new industries within that smart network, within that industrial symbiotic opportunity for CCU? So reduce, reuse, recycle. So considering CO2 within that same uh, element, and then in terms of if we can't, okay, we'll have to landfill it. Well, let's explore how and where we're going to uh, carbon capture and store. Um, and then in terms of working with infrastructure providers and working with Bayes a lot to the expert work groups, but underpinning that, of course, building and working with uh, universities. So as we go through, we identify these challenges, we start to identify research priorities and research um, opportunities that we know we can we see, we start to see as we develop this regional vision, what we're going to need. And of course, the skills, skills development. What are skills development plans in Wales and the UK? How do we work with our regional skills partnerships, uh, Welsh government to start and help them develop the skills that we're gonna need. So we start to develop this regional view, this regional vision of, um, of how we can develop and how we fit in to the UK. Um, we then start to explore some of the opportunities of the deployment project. We're doing front-end engineering design studies to up to final investment decision uh, for some of the uh, topics we know we're going to need. Um, and one of those, as I've got a slide for later, of course, is, is with Lanzatech with um, re that recycling opportunity that that gives us and an extra feedstock um, for some of the chemical sectors. Uh, in the region, so chemical industries within the region. National Grid slide shows how that fits together from a hydrogen perspective. But anyway, Southwest, so that was a bit of an introduction of the cluster, how our focus on net zero and challenge for net zero helps us um, and, and gave us some direction to come together as a team, start to ask questions and start to learn a lot about each other's process. Um, so we were, this is more of sort of a regional view to circular economy, regional view on energy efficiency, resource efficiency, and also the legal aspect. Um, we have lawyers now at every single meeting we have. Um, we've incorporated, thanks to Paths of Law, they've come on board with us and they support all our meetings, all our discussions. We've got lawyers there helping us, just protecting us, make sure we're not going to breach any competition laws or anti-competition. Anti uh, protocols, etc. So we, we started to, to sit down and map and educate ourselves. Um, Owen, obviously, on, on the call is our resident guru and expert on circular economy. So within the different companies, we've got different experts that have come forward. Um, and as a grouping, uh, we, we're able to make the most of those. Every, every company, I suppose, is invested individually. Um, within developing of the cluster, because everybody has their own motives, their own incentives, their own reasons for being there. Uh, and then me as a leader, I suppose it's my role to try and facilitate those and balance and juggle uh, and, and pull all those together um, to get that, that best regional perspective. So one of the challenges is with the circular economy was how do we as foundation industries, how can we affect the circular economy directly is where people that work in the steel works, we work in the chemical works. Um, what can we do and how can we help and develop? And we went through, discussed and started to draw and map. And of course, as the cluster then gets more um, engaged within the corporate mechanisms of the companies that are engaged initially, because it typically starts off with individuals that are engaged, they go back into their companies and then you start to get a wider engagement. And all of a sudden, you've got a more, more of the corporate 
element of those individual companies coming forward and starting to feed in and develop into ways um, to support and develop their own individual companies within that cluster grouping. So I won't go through linear to, to circular economy. We started to challenge ourselves a little bit as well. So as a group, how can we potentially come up with a regional vision? Um, can we say that we will have um, zero industrial uh, material waste to landfill by 2025? Uh, can we be 100% utilization resources by 2040? Um, what would that vision look like? How would we measure it? How would we develop it? So we started to use that vision to, to push um, and develop the, the teamwork in ethos actually, and, and just make sure people were engaged and they understood uh, why we were there and what our end objectives were. So in terms of when we started to look at materials, we started to understand the material flows between our different companies. Uh, so the material teams within different industries got more engaged. Um, it was facilitated by a consultant with our NDAs and legal team. Um, but what that started to do was one, it all it identified that's just how much of that work is, is underway at the moment. So one, we needed to pat ourselves on the back to say, wow, what, what an amazing job has been done over, over previous decades. But also, of course, we started to get into the materials experts then who, who within the different companies who were able to bring forward the opportunities that either they had got stuck um, uh, or they, 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 they just couldn't find the research that they uh, support that they needed to develop um, or just by talking with a different industry with a similar problem, we were able to um, look to develop options. So we, we through that programme, we have identified a list of opportunities that will be going forward for further TFI funding to provide that core and seed funding that will uh, just tip the balance in terms of trying to make things and move things further forward. Same with energy, um, mapping the regional energy flows, um looking for opportunities again we found so much benefit from sharing and learning where we might have companies that are 50 miles away that never talk to each other normally um we've got exactly they make different things but they've got exactly the same um energy opportunity or material opportunity so just by sharing and learning and pulling people together and of course that net zero future effect on region and industries so by having that vision of what net zero was going to look like, we were able to start to explore how industries might change um, and therefore start to work a little bit with what their investment profiles might look like and their essential replacement of furnaces, ovens. Um, oh, okay, so now we understand where you're going potentially. Um, how can we try to build this resource efficient circular economy vision um, around that as well to look, explore other opportunities? Legal, I mentioned, um, we've got lawyers at every meeting and we, we've tried to use Capital Law, the legal team, to, to go through some case studies of um, what we might look to do and actually implement um, after these feasibilities and front end engineering design studies are done. Um, so we've been able to support, I suppose, industries in the region by developing and answering, trying to answer some of the legal questions. So do risk assessment, uh, abatement mechanisms, you know, uh, mitigation factors. Um, but one of the examples of the of projects that we've got coming through is, is the Lanzatech process where um, they'll be building, hopefully, um, an ethanol to a kerosene plant at the works, at, sorry, at Port Talbot um, on the docks. Um, and hopefully then that will start to develop a new uh, carbon recycling industry with, within the region. Um, and of course, that opens up other opportunities for us as industrial manufacturers in terms of what we can do with our uh, non-recyclable at the moment, end of waste products in terms of gasification and, and, and chemical feedstock and uh, the, the, the future market and almost the uh, in some ways, I suppose the metals industry is providing the chemical feedstock for the chemical sector um, in terms of CO2, um, but also in terms of some of the material wastes as well. 
So we've managed to get that. Hopefully, is, is going to go through and, and get built. And that's, I suppose, an example of uh, uh, of what's come through this. So what issues and learnings have we had? Unfortunately, most of this has been done through COVID. Um, I think we're all amazed at how much we, we have managed to get done. Uh, but of course, it affected site visits. Um, there's a lot of discussions, obviously, virtually. But in terms of really getting into each other's sites, handling each other's byproducts, um, really exploring the sites, that hasn't happened. So we, we've got to pick that up and, and drive that further forward. Um, for lots of our industries, it was a completely new thing to do in terms of working in that regional group and that regional development. Um, there have been some exciting opportunities coming through. Um, I think the biggest factor, of course, is that just by pulling everybody together, enabling that collaboration, so much has come out of that and will come out of it, but that takes effort. Um, it takes resource. Um, and without that resource to coordinate things, to pull together the meetings, to pick the right topics, to look for funding, then um, the, the, there's a risk that things will, uh, will, will fall back behind again. So we've got concerted effort on trying to develop and understand how we resource things going further forward. So we are at the position where we are now. We've got a cluster plan project runs for another um, two, two years nearly, uh, the deployment project for another three. Um, and then we'll be working with and uh, exploring opportunities around that. Of course, we're working with universities in terms of understanding and building now, as we've got industry together, if we could pull in uh, academia around that to really to support and develop, we can all help ourselves as we move, move further forward and, and develop the region. So I hope that was okay. It's a bit of a uh, case study, I suppose, maybe, of uh, industries working together to start to develop circular economy and resource efficiency. And now we'll look at the universities to, uh, to come in and support. Well, thank you, Chris, for, for a very, I will say, beautiful example of, of how the power of collaboration can actually lead a significant transformation. And I'm certain there are a lot of lessons learned in bringing all this different community together. So now uh, I would like to, to invite all our speakers uh, to turn on their cameras and also the members of the management committee of the Network Plus. Um, to turn on their, their cameras. Uh, as the previous slide, uh, now uh, I will share just the future plans for the Network Plus. As mentioned, when we started uh, the, the workshop, we have a couple of, of interesting events. So on Friday, very relevant to the workshop today, our Blue Skies Green Futures webinar, there's a still opportunity to register and we will be placing the link for the Eventbrite in the chat. So if you haven't done so, please register. It will be very interesting. Uh, 1st of October, kind reminder, a funding call closes, uh, resource efficiency, recovery, secret economy. We have received quite a lot of of inquiries from different people, industry. Uh, it seems like it, there are a lot of interest uh, in this particular call. So based on, on how things go, we might make the decision in the future to, to open another call that can complement this one. We also will be announcing uh, some other opportunities uh, linked to the new Centers for Secular Economy that could also support some, some of these ideas. Uh, on 6th of October, we have the launch of the Transfire Research Hub. I will say one of the sister or, uh, yeah, initiatives uh, that will be working for the foundation industries. And this will be joined with the KTN conference. So please join us uh, in the Transfire launch. It will be really exciting. The program is, is very rich and well, the, the Network Plus will be supporting this activity. The 18th of October, we will uh, host as a network along with KTN, uh, a sensors, controls and digitalization conference. Uh, we also will have some very interesting talks and uh, I think just recently we just closed the, the abstract submission, but it's, it's very topical, digitalization is gaining a lot of uh, interest in this sphere, so please join us. Uh, 27th of October, 
we will have another uh, webinar. This time is Professor Karnes Scrivener, and she is a world leading scientist in, in cements, and she's the uh, Innovandi uh, Network uh, Coordinator, which is the Global Cement and Concrete uh, Association Research Innovation Network. So she will have some very cool, interesting things to, to discuss. And finally, uh, on the 3rd of November, we will have the KTN conference in energy efficiency, uh, relevant for, for many of the things that uh, we have discussed uh, during this workshop. So we have a very busy schedule over the past, over the next couple of months, sorry. And well, we hope that you can join us. So now uh, we will start questions and answers uh, session. So if you can place your questions in, in the chat, uh, we can uh, indicate in who, who of the speakers uh, you would like to address that question, uh, that will be great. Uh, and of course, uh, if, if anyone has any comments, so oh, please uh, go ahead. Nope. I think everyone has been very active in the in the breakout rooms, <laughs> uh, or maybe people just just want to go, uh, to go have some some lunch. So uh, anyway, I'm gonna can I chip in with one, Susan? Then if that's all right, yeah, I think absolutely. I put one to, to, fill, to fill in the chat earlier on, but I think he might have missed it, so I'm just gonna repeat it. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. That's okay. Uh, but it, it was a question about, you were talking about, and we had a quite an interesting discussion actually following up in our breakout session about where the best use of, of biomass might be. Um, so, you know, a lot of the foundation is look at them in the context of combustion, essentially, or pyrolysis. So, um, but, you know, that was quite an eye-opening talk. And I was wondering whether Croda or the sector in general have an agreed approach to measuring sustainability? So that was part of our session and, and led this morning about um, measurement and valuing sustainability and um, the, the, the conclusion is it's a work in progress. The easy thing to measure is greenhouse gas emissions. The difficult thing to measure is land impact, impact on biodiversity, social equality and so on. So I think the answer is, Cameron, no, there isn't a standard way of measuring, but there are ways of measuring. And you know, we're a science and technology based company. And if we can't measure it, we struggle to, to to show progress so you know we are we have our approaches that we're you know hoping get not ours could necessarily get standardized but we hope that the industry becomes more standardized in some of those measures um and that applies right through to investors and and, and the finance community as well thanks uh, it's really interesting though because one of the questions i suppose that, that we were discussing in our breakout room was well what does that actually mean in terms of the best route for the material yeah. And and really, we'll probably only be able to assess that if all of the different stakeholders are measuring the same thing. We'll only be able to know that objectively. So people internally can, can assess their own value proposition. But what does that look like between sectors? And then how do we agree which people should take what as resources? Is the, 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 the challenge is at the other end of that spectrum, Cameron, is we could sit and wait for a long time to get to the point where we've got agreed frameworks to measure and, and to value. Um, but we've got to act now. And so it's, it's a case of, of, of picking our way through that with, as long as it's with good intent and with deep thought and design um, and then learning. And, and I think one of the things I was actually talking this morning to colleagues, we're thinking about a lot about life cycle analysis at the moment and, and what does full life cycle analysis really mean? I'm sure we could have a whole series on that here, but um, you know, one of the discussion points is actually what we set up as our framework and model today maybe that won't look the same in two or three years time as we've all developed and learned more. And so we've got to stay flexible in our approach and, and, and go with the latest thinking. Um, but it's tough, it's tough, but that does, shouldn't be an excuse not to act. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So actually I have a, a question for, for Chris, if Chris is still with us. Yeah, sorry, yep. Brilliant. Just. Uh, in, in one of your final slides, you mentioned that the cluster, uh, one of the goals of the cluster will be developing a roadmap for, for the industry. So, because uh, we hear so much about roadmapping recently, 
how, how this roadmap will be different to, to those that already exist for the individual industries that are already part of the cluster? I suppose most of the industries, well, they, well, you know, they, they won't have a defined roadmap um, or they will have a roadmap with assumptions so that we will be able to get hydrogen from X. We will be able to uh, store our CO2 there. We'll be able to um, turn our CO2 into this. Um, I, I suppose by looking at it from a regional perspective, it provides that economy of scale um, and the infrastructure to, uh, to make sure our individual industries can fine tune and refine their, their roadmap uh, around the facilities that will be open to them within that specific ge geographical area. Okay, so it will be a decarbonization and resource efficiency type road roadmap. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it's when you, when you when you really look at net, what net zero means, you know, we're going to have to um, really struggle to get to <laughs> and look in all directions to uh, to help in every way we can. So resource efficiency, circular economy will be key elements of our net zero ambition. Yeah, I think I think it's 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 really challenging and, and this roadmap could be transformative uh, considering the number of industries and, and different factors that the cluster is actually tackling at present. Uh, well, anyone has perhaps any other comments or, or questions? Uh, maybe Ian, would you like to have a, a no, final got, uh, goal so, to the statement? I'll just say, Susan, just, um, just before um, we go, I'll yes. give a shameless plug. So um, I'm Ben Walsh, I'm the Deputy Challenge Director for the whole challenge um, and just to give you guys the heads up we've got a really big competition that's going to be open um, towards the end of this year so we've got 15 million pounds we're going to give out to up to four projects so they're quite meaty projects that have got to work cross sector so either get in contact with uh, myself or I think Sarah Sarah Connolly is here as well on the um, on the this is popped up um, or on the chat um, or talk to the Network Plus or the Transfile Hub or the KTN and we can kind of start getting you um, circulated around it. It's going to be around resource or energy efficiency in the foundation industry. It's got to be cross sector. It's got to be, you know, some deliver something at scale um, and the whole heap of other details. Uh, the deadline for an expression of interest stage is the first week in December. So we've got some time and that's a relatively light touch one. On the back of that, the, the successful EOIs will go through and get some funding to actually build a full proposal for final submission in March next year. So do contact us and talk to us. Right. Thank you, Ben. I think everyone welcomes uh, when, when you open such generous <laughs> goals, particularly this one. So I hope that, that these workshops actually facilitate some connections with people to start sparking some ideas to, to apply for, for the Innovate UK funding. We will also be advertising, hopefully, all these opportunities in the Network Plus website. So please, if you have not joined us as a member, do so, and then you will have access to all these information and opportunities. So I think uh, we are reaching the end of the workshop. Uh, I would like to thank everyone that uh, stayed with us. Uh, all morning, very insightful conversations, uh, very interesting things came up from this workshop. Uh, and I would like to invite uh, Ian, our Network Plus uh, director, perhaps for a final word for closing the, the workshop. Ian? Thank you very much, Susan, and uh, a fabulous job, by the way. Um, so thank you for participating. Uh, certainly, we had a, a very good discussion in the breakout sessions and some excellent talks today. Um, I learned quite a bit, which is a good thing, um, and I hope uh, the uh, participants in the workshop also learn some things as well. Uh, we have our call 1st of October to reiterate what Susan says on, on our mini project or small projects, and that includes ECRs uh, for, for um, early career researchers as well. If there's any postdocs out there want to put some ideas of their own down on paper and try and get funded, that's also permissible within the TFI M plus uh, research fund. So I wish you all a good uh, rest of the day and thank you all again for participating. I think it's been excellent. And uh, thank you, Susan and Debbie and Neil in the background who've been making this uh, work as seamlessly as it has. 
Thank you.